Hi. Hi, everybody. I think I've seen all of you. I've met all of you before. Um, so I'll just say my intro again, but I'm Daniel, Assistant Director of Admissions. So I'm really here to help you um, throughout the application process with PTCAS and answer any questions that you may have. Um, and we are here tonight with the diversity and inclusion team here at Northwestern uh, Department of Physical Therapy. And we're super excited to have a good conversation tonight and to learn about the, the resources and support that the diversity and inclusion team uh, offers. And so um, to get started, I'm going to go ahead and, and just to give you all a background, um, Roberto and Toby. So um, we, uh, I think all of the students here have uh, been through a virtual info session. So they understand, they understand the gist of what the, what the curriculum kind of looks like and stuff. Um, and a lot of these students have been on the different faculty forums with the neuro team, PEDS team, all of that. And, um, and so all of them have expressed some kind of interest in diversity and inclusion. And so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We've got, um, we've got Dr. Toby Yeats here. Is it Yeats or Yates, Toby? It's Yates. It's Yates, okay. Yes, it is. We got Dr. Toby Yates here. <laughs> and then we've got um, also Dr. Roberto Lopez Rosado as well. So I'll go ahead and have y'all introduce yourselves um, and then we'll, we'll open it up for a discussion. Um, so you want to you wanna get us started, Toby? I will, yeah. Okay. First of all, hi, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. So um, as Daniel said, my name is Toby Yates and I'm a physical therapist. Um, I'm on the faculty at Northwestern and my history is a little bit convoluted and long, but I started full-time on the faculty in 2009. And I was on the faculty working with the musculoskeletal team. Uh, I have a board certification in orthopedic physical therapy. So that's my area of clinical specialty. And I was doing research at the time um, with um, back muscles, neck muscles, MRI imaging in our neural lab, um, neuroimaging research lab. And then I um, actually left the full-time position in maybe 2014. And I went back to doing more clinical work and I just did adjunct work for the department. So I was still, um, I'm part of the anatomy, gross anatomy team. And so I was teaching gross anatomy the whole time and some other foundational courses in the department. And then um, I actually joined back into a full-time position just in January of 2020. And so now I'm rejoining the faculty as a director of clinical education. And so what that means is when our students go through the curriculum and it's time to go out into the clinic, I am one of three people who helps facilitate and make sure students are getting out into the clinic, that they are um, finding spots that are of interest to them and that help them meet their uh, graduation requirements. I'm helping facilitate what you're learning in the clinic in terms of making sure that if you have any struggles or difficulties, I'm one of the go-to people for that. And my current area of um, interest in terms of research is about diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, it's about um, the student experience. And it's also about facilitating or finding ways to increase the membership um, of more diverse members of the physical therapy profession and helping to find ways to, you know, to find out where are the students, how do we garner interest in physical therapy and how do we get them to want to give back to their communities um, in terms of graduation and going back out again. And all of that, I'll finish with this, all of that is to help um, to try to start to address health inequities and healthcare inequities. So that's my story. Roberto. Awesome. Thank you so much, Toby. So we'll, we'll have Roberto next. And this is always very interesting because Toby and I have known each other for 10 years and every time we 
introduce ourselves in any form, I always learn something new about her, um, which is very interesting. But um, so my name is uh, Roberto Lopez Rosado, and I um, I'm also a, like Toby. I'm a physical therapist as well. Um, I've been a PT for I don't know maybe 15 years or so. Before I became a PT, I uh, went to school and and uh, for anatomy. So I am an anatomist as well. <clears throat> um, and, and I think in September, it would mark uh, my 23rd year of teaching um, anatomy, uh, which makes me feel really, really old. Um, but here we are. Um, I, um, I've been at Northwestern for, ten, for the last 10 years. And before that, I taught at Florida Gulf Coast University. That's in the Fort Myers area in Florida. Um, and before that, I taught in Puerto Rico, which is where I'm originally from. I, um, what attracted me to Northwestern was a, an opportunity open up for research, specifically um, uh, in robotics, in the area of, of neuro, neurological uh, physical therapy. And after, before that, uh, I, uh, I did a little bit of research, um, but it was mostly on education. And I still do a little bit of that too. Um, so I, I moved to Northwestern, uh, to Chicago um, later in 2010, and then um, became um, active in uh, neuro PT. Um, we have, um, an, a national association, you probably have heard of it, the, Amer the APTA, we call it, the American Physical Therapy Association. Um, and my involvement in neuro research uh, opened up opportunities to be an advocate and also to, be, to serve as a volunteer in this organization. And I just stepped down um, after a five-year uh, position there. In, in, in that time, I was the co-chair of online uh, education for neuro PT. Um, so I have a big passion in neuro. Um, and um, when you come to campus, you'll see me in anatomy courses, but mostly in neuro courses, specifically neuroanatomy, uh, which I'm, I feel very passionate about. Um, after 10 years of doing mostly stroke research, um, post-stroke uh, post rehab research, um, I became more interested in the inequities in health and disparities um, for special populations and minorities. Um, so Toby, uh, like she said, she just rejoined the faculty and now the two of us are the co-chairs of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, which we'll talk about a little bit more during this call. But um, all this work had led me to change my research interest. And now I am pursuing another degree because I'm a little crazy uh, in health services and outcomes research uh, with a focus on disparities. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about it. Um, and um, I started doing some work uh, in that field and it's, it's very, very exciting. So I'm, I'm working on my first publication as we speak uh, in that new field. Um, yeah, besides that, I, um, I also teach for other programs within the Northwestern um, campus, um, one of them being the Center for Prosthetics and Orthotics. So I teach anatomy to them as well. So, well, thank you so much for your intro, Roberto, and um, we're glad to have both of you here. So. Roberto, if you'd, if you'd like, I, um, I'd love for you to give kind of an overview of the diversity and inclusion team, like what the mission is, what y'all do, um, and that kind of stuff. And that maybe will give a uh, segue into our overall discussion. Yeah, absolutely, Daniel. Um, so um, Toby was actually the first chair, I believe, of diversity and inclusion when the committee was originally um, um, started. Um, so that preceded my involvement. Um, and I want to say that's, that was probably back maybe six years ago, five or six years ago, maybe even more. Um, 
And um, after, well, during the time that Toby was actually doing some clinical work and focusing on that, um, I, I, took the, I took the leadership role. Um, so I learned a lot from her and we've always worked together. Um, and currently the model that we have for the diversity, equity and inclusion committee um, we divided it up into two subcommittees. Um, there's about 10 members uh, that are active participants of it. Um, and that includes uh, faculty, staff members, and we also have diversity scholars, which I will expand on um, later on, because this involves uh, the potential for scholarship. So I'll, I'll definitely talk to you about that as well. Um, the two subcommittees, uh, we, um, we originally called them internal affairs and external affairs. So for the external affairs committee, um, basically what, what, the, the, what the mission uh, for that subcommittee is, is to establish partnerships with um, communities that are um, local and also global as well. Um, so uh, just to give you an example of some of these act, uh, some of these activities or some of this work, um, within the city of Chicago, we have areas that are underrepresented uh, and very very talented students that come from these areas and um, that are exploring physical therapy as a potential viable opportunity for um, professional development. So we bring uh, students. Uh, these are students that are um, attending high school that they have a special interest in, uh, in health sciences and the allied health professions. Um, and we explain to them what physical therapy is. Um, we involve students in this kind of visit. We show them a little bit of our program, but we also teach them some manual skills uh, just so that they get some real, um, some real hands-on experience. This is very exciting and I love these kind of events because uh, students have all kinds of questions that you would never even think about, um, you know, at that age. Um, and we also bring patients that have received physical therapy um, from multiple conditions. So students get to kind of appreciate um, what PT might be from different perspectives. Um, we also have some partnerships with the School of Medicine. And uh, there's a, every year there's a boot camp for um, individuals that are college students, um, very much like yourselves, that are exploring PT also as an, as an opportunity to develop further. So um, we participate along with other schools within, um, within Feinberg, which is the School of Medicine. We have more than, um, besides the School of Medicine, there's also a master's in prosthetics and orthotics. There's also a master's in uh, physician assistant. Um, and a program, a master's program in genetic counseling, which shares the same building that we are at. So that's a little bit of the out, um, the external affairs uh, subcommittee. Um, we also are very involved in recruiting efforts. So, um, and Daniel has been um, a big part of that. Um, and so he has visited um, schools, um, you know, um, in the country um, to attract the type of student that we're very interested in having um, as, as being part of Northwestern. Um, and then the Internal Affairs Subcommittee, uh, this other committee deals more with retention and culture within the department. So we, we like to think of the department more than just a uh, uh, the building that houses us. Uh, we are in reality a community and this community is formed by the student body, which is by far the largest part of the community, but also faculty, staff, uh, adjuncts, uh, graduate students, um, besides our DPT students, um, and community members that are, you know, that play a big part in our curriculum as well as other events. So the internal sub affairs subcommittee, um, what it does is we provide uh, training sessions, mostly in education for faculty and staff, and we support uh, student-led discussions as well. 
um, as you probably are all aware of, um, in the last three weeks, um, we have had quite a variety of um, really important, relevant topics that um, touch very deeply um, um, the Black community um, and people of color in general. And so um, a lot of times in, in academic programs, um, we need to provide a space for the entire community to process and work and talk about these things because they all touch each other in a very different way. So part of our job is to facilitate these conversations and to bring educational pieces when, when it's appropriate. Um, so needless to say, we've been working really hard in the last few weeks, um, um, but that also includes every single component of our community. Um, and maybe, Daniel, I don't know if this is the right time to touch on the diversity scholarship. Is it okay if I mention that? So um, there is a, a small, it's a small scholarship right now, um, and we only um, award one scholarship per year. But um, this, this scholarship um, is a competitive one, and you would be eligible um, as you as you start as a new student in the fall, um, if this interests you. Um, the purpose of the scholarship is to have um, a student representative that not only serves as a liaison between the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee and their classmates, but also a leader in diversity uh, initiatives. Um, and of course, more than just one person gets um, uh, get involved. So. Right now, we're working on special interest groups, and there's a big, there's big interest in in creating one for specifically DEI um, initiatives. So that's in the works. Hopefully, there's some structure by the time you are, um, you're all in. Um, let me see. Oh, so I um, I said that it was a small scholarship. Um, it's a it's a five thousand dollar award per year for a total of fifteen thousand dollars during the duration of the program. And uh, we typically open up applications um, shortly after you come on board. And we give you a few months um, to gauge um, your life as a grad student, as a doctoral student, and, uh, and your interest level. And if you're still interested, then you're more than welcome to apply. And we will remind you uh, more than once um, so you don't miss the opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you, Roberto, for that overview. And so, you know, we'd love to have a discussion here and open it up for questions. I know that you all may have some questions that you you come with. Um, and so if you'd like, there's multiple ways to, to ask a question. You can either physically raise your hand or you can use the, the hand raise function here in Zoom, which uh, the way you get to that is you hit participants, the participants button at the bottom, and then next to your name, you'll be able to raise your hand that way. And so we will uh, turn the floor over to you all. Would you all like to start, would anyone like to start off with a question? I have a couple topics my own self and a couple of questions that I'd like to throw out, but I'm, I'm gonna let uh, our participants here get us started. Were you raising your hand, Arturo? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, <clears throat> so you guys were talking about how you provide education and training uh, for diversity and inclusion to graduate students. Uh, so I just wanted to know um, what that kind of entails and how you guys deal with uh, situations where, let's say when we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, and then um, somebody goes ahead and says something problematic as all lives matter. Uh, do you guys point that out? Or do you guys open it up for discussion? How do you uh, deal with situations like that? So um, I, can, I can talk to you about two things that we do this training. Um, the first one, uh, the one that's student led uh, with some support from faculty and other parts of Northwestern um, is a series of workshops um, that work more like a panel 
they're pretty structured and um and these are just for students um currently they're being led by um a dual degree student um so this student um, is a phd candidate but uh, she also holds a DPT from our program. Um, and then there's also, um, so part of those, part of those topics, uh, Arturo, um, are curricular, um, uh, they're part of the curriculum. And currently there is a track um, of courses. Um, so it belongs mostly to um, the psychosocial um, sciences track. Um, and as you can imagine, this curriculum is evolving and um, we're trying to catch up with um, current matters. Um, it's, um, it's reviewed every year. Um, and uh, what's currently, the way it was taught this past year since I was a part of it, um, it was taught by a team um, of, it was a combination of uh, internal and outside um, um, facilitators. Um, and in, I don't think I have, or I don't think I recall um, an instant where, you know, somebody had said something as wrong as, or as what you um, provided as an example. Um, we have had very recently in the last few weeks, a couple of public forums that involved pretty much everyone, every part of the community. Um, and I think everyone was very, very respectful and uh, guidelines were provided for um, what could be considered constructive um, shares. Um, we, what we try to do even in class is we try to, we, we try to provide a safe environment so people can share and ask questions. But at the same time, um, I think there's a very, um, how should I say this? Um, there's a collective, um, very respectful way of communicating. Um, and that has been my experience in all the forums that I've been part of. Um, I don't know if Toby or Daniel want to add anything to that. I want to. My dog, of course, just came running to the window, barking and screaming. I apologize that you'll have to listen to that. Um, I was trying to stay muted, so thank you, Roberto, for bringing me in right now. Um, I, I, I wanted to say, I think that Roberto said something that I think is important. I think the collective from the department is, um, comes from a place of caring and of wanting to learn. I will be honest in saying that we, I think as a department have made mistakes, whether in the curriculum or even in conversation. Um, so I don't want you to think that we have everything perfect and that we get it right all the time. Everybody's working still. But I think what you'll find is there is, there is a collective agreement that it's important there is a collective willingness to just talk about it openly. Um, there's a collective accountability for the fact that sometimes we, we don't quite hit the mark right on the head and we, we need to kind of go back and rethink. And Roberto said, you know, even within the curriculum, it's, it's looked at every year, it's reviewed, it's changed, updated to try to help. Um, and then there are ideas, other ideas that are being generated now. For example, um, Roberto said we had a couple of really fantastic open forums recently. And so we thought, you know, is this something that we can continue to work on? Is this something that we could have maybe some of the leaders in DEI from our university help perhaps to come in on a somewhat regular basis? Maybe it's a couple times a year and also help facilitate learning and conversations. And it's, it really does go from faculty and staff to DPT students and graduate students. Um, it's kind of a, it really, Roberto said, it's a community and it's a collective. And so we are, we are continuing to grow. And the last thing I'll say is um, that 
everyone on the faculty is open and receptive to ideas that actually come from the students. And so this isn't just something that is, hey, here's the faculty and guess what? We're gonna tell you everything we're gonna do. We appreciate feedback from students and so we do listen to students. And again, it goes back to students sometimes having to say like, I don't quite think you got this right. Um, let's try again. So we're, we're open to that. We, we actually, I think, are looking for that even more and more now um, because it's an open dialogue. I'll finish with that. Thank you both. That's a great, great way to finish, Toby. I was gonna echo exactly what you said. Just from the outside, I'm not a faculty member, but you know, a strength that I see our department has is just that willingness to be open to students. Cause it would be easy for the faculty to just be like, hey, we've got the answers. Here's how we're gonna do it. Here's what the curriculum is like. But lately, you know, we've seen students to be like, hey, in class, I don't like the way you say this. Or like, I think you're missing this. And the, the faculty are like, okay, let's talk about it. And so I think that's such a huge strength, especially for like, you know, our program is number four in the country. So it could easily be like, hey, we're do we think we're doing pretty well. Like there's nothing to change, but I've seen that our department is always trying to do better at what at whatever they can. Um, so thank you, Toby and Roberto for those answers. And thank you, Arturo, for that question. Okay, so I'm trying to keep all of the questions in order. So uh, Kelsey raised her hand next. Hi, you guys. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Um, so my question is, does the program provide any spaces for cross-cultural discussion to allow students to know and learn the backgrounds of their classmates and the professors? I, Sorry. Go yeah, ahead. You, you, you want to go ahead, Toby? Um, I, I'll piggyback on you after you're done. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Yes, there are, um, I believe there's um, specifically in this course, um, there's, uh, there's an assignment um, that includes a reflection on everyone's culture. Um, and the assignment is to create a culture gram. Um, I was not part of this team uh, prior, in prior years, but um, this year they invited me. So I, um, I was part of the panel of people that joined. And um, I, I proposed, well, we are asking this of the students, we should probably lead by example. So the instructors that um, formed the panel um, shared our culture grams first. And this is, this is a session that happens very early in the fall term. Um, I, I think at first, and this is full confession here, I'm going to go full confession mode. I didn't know how vulnerable I was going to feel afterwards because I, um, I share my cultogram, which pretty, it's in the nutshell is the story of my life, which is very colorful. Uh, you'll hear it one day, I hope. Um, uh, it would be in my honor to tell, to tell you, um, uh, it's and it's an honor because it humbles me and it makes you see me right the way the way I am um, but um, I had my first lecture the week after I shared my culture gram and and I I started my lecture by saying I, I feel so naked I, I I don't know you as well as you think uh, know me um, so yes, I guess to, to address the question, um, in that class, um, you will be assigned to a small group and, um, and individuals will get a chance to share some of these things that are very intimate. And, uh, and of course you share at the level of, at, at your level of comfort, right? Um, we even go back and we start sharing some vulnerabilities even when you come for orientation. Um, I, um, I always like to echo the words of one of the directors of diversity and inclusion, which is the only way to know each other is to tell each other our stories, right? So that 
that requires a level of vulnerability and uh, and there's a lot of bravery and courage when you do that. Um, but it's a it, it's a better way also to um, to get to really know you know who you are, and um, and we return the favor. So it's it's not a one direction only. Um, and there's I would say that there's plenty of opportunities for self reflection. Um, in the program and across the curriculum, so you'll be you'll be asked multiple times to self-reflect, um, and a lot of and a lot of that is going to be reflected back to your own culture, who you are, your identity as a person, which is very powerful. Um, yeah, Toby, you wanted to say something. Thanks, Roberto, and uh, you know you really said a lot of the the things that I was talking about and that I would have said also. Um, and I might just add really quickly, um, I'm sorry, I'm smiling because my eight-year-old is trying to sneak in here on me and, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, I'm sorry, she's handing me stuff. I'm so sorry, <laughs> like I can't talk to you right now. Um, so Roberto kind of talked a little bit about <clears throat> at the early onset and and students are, are actually doing this as assignments and in class. Um, throughout the curriculum, and this is really more informal, Kelsey, so this gives you a sense of, sure, that's curricular types of activities, but students are placed together in groups for a lot of different activities across the different coursework throughout the curriculum. And so um, what I find happens is that students are getting to know each other and learning about each other's backgrounds and cultures on an ongoing basis based on who they're interacting with within some of their small groups. And the small groups are not the same for every course throughout your entire didactic portion. So you do get a chance to interact with and get to know people um, in more informal ways, you know, the ways that students want to connect with each other. And so some of it is inorganic in that you're simply placed together by random assignment. But then some of that learning about each other also occurs. Thanks for asking about that. Yeah, thank you, Toby. Thank you, Roberto, for elaborating. I truly appreciate it. So thanks for your question, Kelsey. All right, so next we've got Nikki next. Hi. Um, my question was just, what is Northwestern doing to ensure diversity among the faculty in the DPT program? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Nikki. Um, so what's interesting about your question, just to begin with, is that to ensure diversity of the faculty, there's gotta be a pool from which to choose from. And that means we have to have a pool of diverse physical therapists who get, you know, maybe go back and get some kind of other advanced degree or something who are interested in also then teaching. And so what we find is that because we're, we've been turning out maybe not the most diverse crew of physical therapists for the past 30 years, we have fewer faculty, fewer candidates to choose from who want to be faculty. And so, um, so unfortunately, I think that while Northwestern itself is very committed to finding and fostering the development of faculty like that, they have to be able to find the candidates first. Um, I happen to be the only member of the, the faculty right now who is black, um, there are representations from other areas and they're well supported and welcomed. Um, but again, I think it starts with how do you even find those candidates and bring those candidates in when the pool to select from is very small. I don't know if either of you has additional thoughts. Yeah, I would add to that that um, 
the percentage of underrepresented minorities that are PTs are, is less than 10%, significantly less. Um, so I just, I just wanted to give you an idea of, um, just for perspective purposes, um, it's, that's what every single PT program wants. <laughs> um, and there's many that don't even have um, any underrepresented. The, when I left the program that I taught in Florida, the entire diversity pool left with me. Um, we were a smaller program. Uh, there were 10 of us and uh, there, was, there was not any diversity um, at all. Um, we have some racial and some ethnic, ethnic um, diversity within the faculty. We can definitely improve on that. Um, I think we have um, uh, a diverse um, staff group. And the students we have been, we have had probably the most diverse students in the last four or five years. Um, and this is, uh, this, is part of, this is part of our work, which is precisely, I, was, uh, I sat on the search committee that brought Toby back. Um, and um, and we, have, we have had other individuals that um, are also diverse, but they are, they are also very hard to get um, because other big programs are competing for them. So we have, we have made offers um, and we have done our best to match certain things depending on the line. Uh, it, is an ongoing, it is an ongoing process. Um, and I would say um, uh, the APTA holds a very, very large uh, once a year conference. Um, this year was in February and it was uh, in Denver. And there are many meetings held there, both formal and informal, uh, to attract recent graduates um, with terminal degrees. Um, they are approached by many of us. Um, so I think, I think this is a situation where a lot of hands are on deck um, and there's, the effort is there. Um, it's ongoing, but yes, we can definitely do better, but we're doing better than many others. Yeah, um, and I'm gonna add to from an admissions perspective because Nikki, you also asked, yeah, you asked about, you know, what are we doing to increase diversity, even with our student, you know, the, the faculty and the students. And, you know, I just started last year with, uh, with the admissions team. And I know myself and uh, along with the director of admissions, her name is uh, Dr. Heather Henderson. Um, diversity is really big for us. And, you know, you always want, so correct me if I'm wrong, Roberto and Toby, but physical therapy is mostly white women. And, but when you look at the people who physical therapists are serving, it's not mostly white women. And so like, you always want to have that, that's always in our mind, like you want it to kind of reflect each other. And so like, for example, with us on the admissions team, I travel and Roberto um, touched on this a little bit in the beginning, but I travel over all over the country to recruit a diverse group of students. Like I went to, uh, and we work with the diversity and inclusion team to do this. Um, you know, Toby and I were set to, to go to an event um, on the west side, west side of Chicago to talk to, um, I think it was mostly black students uh, there about physical therapy. I, th I think they were in high school, so early on in, in their careers. Um, I went to Spelman College, which is in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a historically black college. Um, so there was a whole uh, event there. It was like a fair. Um, students who are interested in medical school, physical therapy, 
I went to San Bernardino, California for an event there where most students um, were Hispanic. I mean, we're, we're getting out there um, intentionally trying to have a diverse group of students just to get students in the pipeline to apply. Um, students who may not have seen physical therapy as an option uh, for a career. I get a lot of students who were, were just thinking about medical school. They're like, oh, I've never thought about, I've never thought about physical therapy. And so like Roberto said, you know, it's, it's an ongoing thing. And hopefully we start to see the fruit of some of this labor uh, soon. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. I appreciate the outwork or the outreach stuff that you guys are doing. And thank you for your honesty and your answers. You're welcome. And also, Nikki, this is a long term investment. So our hope is that you, some of you statistically will become faculty members. So the more diverse our classes, you know, the bigger that pool is going to be over time. And we are we're starting as early as high school because <laughs> there's Again, it's a it's a long it's a long term investment. And I wanted to add too, um, and I think this touched on Arturo's question. I think, but I uh, just in terms of what we do for our current students as well, and just like being culturally sensitive about things, we had a brown bag event with our with our faculty and staff members with that was all about names and Roberto um, led led that uh, event and it was just the, the importance of names and I just remember a particular part of that about pronouncing people's names correctly and, you know and just how important that is and just our faculty member you know we came up with even ideas like the fact that at the beginning of every course, when the professor is to pronounce people's names, we have the student phonetically spe phonetically spell out their name so it's pronounced correctly. Because you know, so we try to be really intentional about that. And I hope that some of you all, even on some of our virtual calls that we've had, I if I see your name and I don't know how to pronounce it, I you know I I ask you. Um, like I remember Viva, I was like, is it Viva or Viva? Um, she was like, oh, thank you. you know, so we, we try to be culturally sensitive and we have these workshops and events, um, for students and faculty to do that. Um, okay. So next was Mary Kate. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your Wednesday evening with us. Um, I believe this is the last session of these and I've thoroughly enjoyed all of them. Um, I see some familiar faces and I feel like they've been super helpful. So um, my question is kind of piggybacking off of that and to go back to the external affairs, um, specifically with the high school um, population. Um, I was wondering if someone could elaborate on that program, um, how the DPD students are involved, if there's um, a mentorship up our opportunity, um, I know some schools do a three plus three program with high schools. Um, so wondering if that's in the pipeline, um, just to get that, to, to reach that diversity, um, starting early. Yeah. So, um, I can, um, I can address some of your questions. Um, so Mary Kate, I, um, there's, uh, there's a couple of programs that we have, um, that we collaborate with. Uh, one of them is, is called H Prep, and it's an acronym that stands for Health Professions Exposure Program. Uh, this is a competitive program. Uh, it's open for both high school and college students. Um, so students apply, <clears throat> and then they are brought to the Chicago campus, and it's a series of Saturday mornings. So we spend some time with them. They they go through different uh, departments of medicine. They also, um, they also spend time with PA, genetic counseling, and PT. Um, to give you an example of how that looks like, so um, the group is typically, we're talking maybe 25 to 30 individuals. Uh, and sometimes it could be a mix of high school and college, sometimes it's either or. Um, and uh, we, we gave them a short tour of the department. 
And then um, we explain what physical therapy is. We try to get to know them a little bit um, and see, kind of engage their interest about what, what, their, what, their profession, what they think the profession is or if they have had personal experiences with it. Um, but we, we honestly don't want to spend a lot of time talking. We, wanted, we want to show them and give them a hands-on experience. So the, this is completely voluntary. Uh, students that want to become uh, part of this event uh, can and join every year. Um, and we typically have three stations. We create three, sta three stations. One of them is typically an open panel with patients. The other one might be um, uh, a simulation of an outpatient visit, uh, maybe using an app uh, or something. Um, the other one, maybe simulating an inpatient room uh, and teaching them how to do transfers and things like that. Uh, things that they would do if they were a PT working in, at a hospital, for example. Um, and they don't, of course, they don't do this alone. So we train the students on how to do these skills with them. Um, and then we have our students, there's always a faculty mentor in every station, but we have our students kind of lead this session and show them some of the things that they have learned themselves in the last year or two. Um, and eventually this becomes a very, very powerful um, kind of program because after the rotations are done, we all gather together and uh, we have a panel of PTs and they're all uh, PTs of um, different groups, uh, underrepresented groups. So I think that's very important because the students that are participating also see people that look like them. And, and it becomes more, it, it, the part that I think is most powerful is students learn what their life journeys have been. How did they end up in this career? So, um, so we do that for that program, but we also have a similar kind of format for schools that over, the, over time, over the years, we have had a relationship with. So an example of that, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with the city. Um, I live in the north part of the city, Rogers Park, uh, which is, I think, one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the city. Um, and just a few blocks from my house, where I sit right now, there's the Chicago uh, Math and Science Academy. Um, and over the years, I've yeah, become friends with the, um, the biology uh, department chair. And uh, so she's been bringing her students every year for the past four or five years. Um, and it's interesting because as, as these students become older, I am seeing now some of these students apply for H prep and get in. And then, um, and then I hear from them, you know, that they're in college, right? But, they, but I've seen them as they, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's been such a privilege, but uh, just to give you an idea or a taste of how that might be, um, uh, our students love participating in that. Another opportunity, um, another example of, um, of other things that we do, um, there are plenty of community uh, health fairs. And uh, one of them that happens in June every year, uh, unfortunately this year, of course, because of COVID-19, we had to cancel, but for the last four or five years as well, we've been part of, um, of a community uh, fair called Vive Tu Vida, like live your life in, um, in the west side of the city uh, in a neighborhood that's predominantly uh, Hispanic. Um, so we have a large group of students that speak Spanish at different levels of proficiency. And um, everyone that wants to you know, brush up uh, on their Spanish is welcome. Um, I always, I always attend this as well. Um, we are there an entire day and we do balance screens. And for people that um, are at high risk, we have collaborated with uh, nearby clinics so that they can further be examined and, and get the treatment that they need. Um, and those, are, those opportunities are great because um, it, it takes our students out of a, either the school or clinical setting um, and, you know, they, they, they come in contact with members of diverse communities. Um, so those are two examples that I can think of. I'm trying to be conscientious of the time. Um, 
But um, if you want to know more about any of these initiatives, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, I, I don't want to monopolize. I, I, I think I'm talking too much. I'll shut up now. Daniel, take, take it over, Daniel. Oh, no, you're fine. That was, that was a great explanation, Roberto. And thank you for your question, uh, Mary Kate. That was awesome. OK, now we've got Maya's question next, please. Hello. Um, my question was more towards the uh, dual degree program for the DPT and the MPH program. Uh, that's kind of the one that I'm interested in. And I was curious if there's any courses offered from the PT school that kind of overlap with some of the public health courses, specifically in um, health disparities and health inequities. And also if maybe the PT school itself um, offers courses that have um, public health material in it, specifically with the um, health inequities and inequalities. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so Maya, that's a good question. Now, I am going to tell you what I know, and I'll admit it, that it's not as much probably as you would like to hear. Uh, that's because I'm coming from being back for three months and then sent home since March. So um, a couple of things. Now I know there are the students who do the, the dual degree, MPH and the DPT. And there is um, information, it's not entire coursework that is devoted within our PT program, that is devoted to um, healthcare inequities or health inequities. Um, it's really more interspersed within the curriculum. So there is talk about it. It comes up in a number of different courses without ever being the course itself, if that makes sense or if that kind of helps you see um, how it's really woven into the fabric without, without just being the course. The, DPT program, the curriculum, is, is um, it's very specific to the needs of getting our students to be doctors of physical therapy when they finish. And there's not a lot of variance in terms of, or um, there's a word, you guys, I just lost it. When you get to choose electives, Thank you so much. There's not a lot of electives. I mean, we're not, you know, it's not like when you're going through undergrad and you can choose a lot of things. So, um, and that's because it, it's very, obviously a dense program with very specific aims in order to get you all to be doctors of physical therapy. So it's mixed within the curriculum. Uh, the students who choose to do the MPH program in addition, so the dual degree, um, they're actually taking additional coursework so they are taking courses through Northwestern additional coursework as well as doing additional um, kinds of practicum series we call it more of a clinical education but the the uh, MPH program is more of like a practicum of sorts and that's another place where it differs that the the DPT programs don't participate in that uh, however um... And, and uh, I agree with everything that Toby said. I think um, that's definitely true for um, all the students, but um, for some of you, there may be an opportunity to dig into health disparities more if you happen to be selected and chosen for uh, a specific synthesis group, which, you know, this is the topic of interest and research. Um, and every year, I believe there's at least one project that is devoted to health disparities. Um, so, but in, I mean, in all honesty, it's just like Toby said, this is not a, it's not an opportunity that ever, that's open to every single student, just the ones that are paired and match with this particular pre uh, faculty preceptor and, and synthesis group. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question, Maya. 
And so to be conscious of time, we will, uh, we've got three more hands that are raised. So we'll finish, we'll finish out with you three. Um, so we're gonna go Marski, Helen, and then we'll finish out with Michelle. So it's all yours, Marski. Okay, hi, I'm Marski. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, and my question is, because I'm, uh, I'm minoring in disability and human development, so I'm curious about, are there any opportunity for students to learn about disability culture in the DPT program, or any research topic about that? Can, Marski, can I ask a clarif uh, could you clarify what you mean by that? Uh, do you mean like research in disability culture per se, or as a part of the curriculum? Or uh, as a part of curriculum, or maybe, can you talk about both? Because I'm just curious about that. Um, I would say that disability culture is definitely um, covered um, extensively across all the uh, tracks. Um, because it's such a it's such a large component of the plan of care, and um, and the way that we manage patients right across discipline across sub disciplines right. Um, so I would say um, you would get a lot of that content when you are um, when you all will be studying clinical cases. So the cases are that are written are very thoroughly. Um, they're very thorough and they all include a large cultural component, um, which then you will be um, working on with the, with the disability if, if it's present. Uh, so I think, I think that's, very that's largely covered through case discussions um, as well. Uh, I believe there's also some more curricular content that will prepare you before your first clinical experience. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you for your question, Marski. Okay, then we'll, we'll um, have Helen next, please. Hi, I'm Helen, and uh, since uh, Roberto mentioned that statistically, uh, some of the incoming students will eventually become faculty members. Uh, so I have a question um, on work environment at Northwestern, so over, uh, your like throughout your journey at Northwestern as a faculty member, um, how has the atmosphere, or uh, yeah, how has the atmosphere for diversity and inclusion changed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think ten years ago when I first started, um, I uh, so I consider myself a person of color. I'm Puerto Rican. I'm the first thing I do is I, I look down the list of names and see if there's a Hispanic name somewhere while I'm doing this, right? And so that's the first thing I did. And I saw two people with Spanish names, um, which could be either Hispanic or Filipino. So um, that's always a gamble, right? Um, and um, so I immediately con connected with them and I found yeah. out that they were uh, both from Colombia, uh, different, different cities in Colombia. Um, I, my first language is Spanish, so I, it was very important to me to be able to, at one point, just you know, take my English hat off and, and speak without translating in my head, which is exhausting. Um, and um, I think that grew a lot after um, in, I mean, in the next 10 years, um, there were more people of color that were uh, hired. Um, we, have, um, we have a few uh, Asian Americans um, and um, now Toby. And um, I think we have um, a, group of, a group of faculty that even though it's predominantly white, um, like, like we've said before, they're very, very open and willing to um, learn a lot about these things. So um, 
so I, I would say to address the question itself, uh, I think uh, I feel very welcomed. I feel um, that I am heard and I, that my perspective matters and my opinion matters. Um, and which I think it's very, very important uh, to be able to work efficiently and comfortably. And, and I'm not by any means saying that it's a perfect environment and we do have these agreements and we can all work on communication, but, but we are aware of it. And I think we're all um, doing our best to improve what we already have. But that has been my experience. Uh, Roberto, thank you. And, and I'll just add a little bit to that, Helen. Um, so when I started, the very first year I started was 2009. And it was during 2009 or maybe 2010, it was probably a year after I started when the idea of a diversity, equity and inclusion committee group came up. Um, interestingly, it was not my idea. It was started by one of the white males on faculty. <laughs> and, so, um, and so I was actually not the very first chair. I was part of the committee for its inception and then became the chair the very next year. So, um, you know, it, so, so right there, that should show growth um, because the idea was there, there was support for it right away. And one of the very first things we did as a committee was to establish the diversity scholarship. That was a really important piece. And what I find interesting about that is that was within my time, just the last 12 years. And now, you know, and at first it was just a very small sum of money. Uh, the diversity committee was mostly about that. Um, and it's really grown now. It's grown in scope. It's grown in its reach. Um, it's grown in its membership and also in bringing its voice to the table in terms of having a voice when we do faculty meetings and things like that, that there's actually a report from the diversity equity inclusion committee where we talk about what's really going on so if that should sort of demonstrate some of the growth that i've seen over the years um and roberto said you know we're trying to be honest about working very hard to to keep improving i think there's always room for improvement in terms of getting more diversity representation on the faculty about talking more about issues but the interest is there. So thanks, Helen. Thanks for asking about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Helen, for your question. And um, I, I will add before we have Michelle's la uh, Michelle finish us out. Um, there's, you know, diversity comes in all different forms. So, you know, it's racial diversity. There's like geographical diversity. If you know, if you're an international student. Um, you know, we have an LGBTQ office for like just the medical school itself has its own like office and website. Um, and like international students, they have a great resource. I was just on their website earlier today. And if anybody's interested, I can totally send you that link, but they have all types of resources for international students, not just students, but international faculty, um, community alums, anything like that. So I just wanted to point out um, that there's veterans affairs too, like every every single um, way you could be diverse. There's their support. So um, I wanted to put that out there too. Okay, Michelle, finish us out. Hi, my dog is just barking too. So hopefully she doesn't make any noise. Um, so I noticed on the website that the class of 2023 has 6% black students. And like you said, Toby, you're the only black faculty member. And so I was just wondering if there were maybe programs or forums where minorities can maybe connect or have mentorship with either with if it's you or maybe local PTs in the area. Honestly, if it's just like sitting down and talking like just talking about situations, situations that they deal with inside being the only minority or whatnot. And then like Daniel, I'm really interested in what you were just talking about, about the international students, because I'm, I'm not only a black female, but I'm also an international student as well because I live in the Bahamas. So I was just curious about the connections that students are able to make with 
people more like yeah. that. representation yeah. really does matter. Michelle, thank you for asking that. I'll, I'll go ahead and just start off. Um, so the students, I'm going to use this, I'm going to borrow this phrase only because we've been talking about this very recently. And what I'm going to say as affinity groups, folks who are interested and in connecting and finding each other. And so we encourage folks to do just that, to reach out and to find affinity groups. Um, just in the last three weeks, we have a new group which has sort of formed and more, more officially come onto the scene to say, hey, we want to be official. And that's the Black Student Committee. And following that, the Asian students said, we would like to have an Asian student group. And, and maybe committee is not the right word, a group. Um, and so, you know, the students are sort of recognizing too, like, hey, this is kind of nice. I, again, having started in January, the first thing I started pushing for was what I wanted on the, on the departments within the four walls was brave space or safe space or however you want to call it, but actual physical spaces where students can go and just be and hang out and relax and allow themselves to feel the tensions of, of all that you think you should be in a professional program. <laughs> Let it all go and hang out. That's a really important thing for me that we don't have quite yet, but we're really trying to push for. I find that students are, you guys are so savvy at figuring out how to connect. It will take me 20 minutes to find something on Facebook. It will take you all 30 seconds to find your people. And we want you to find your, your people and connect. So right now, I think the stage that it's at, Michelle, is that there is support in terms of, we love this idea, we encourage you to do it, and we're just now picking up the, up the momentum to actually get interest groups rolling. So you can say, hey, you know, maybe orientation-wise, one of the students said, second years comes up and says, hey, okay, I'm on this group, if anybody's interested in, in connecting with us as black students of physical therapy, come see me, you know, and then somebody else might get up and say, I'm on that Asian group. I'm on the Asian student um, group, not committee. I'm trying to pick my language here, but you know, if anyone's interested in connecting with us and having some conversations, let's go. And I, and I think it's important. I think this is one area where we will continue to actually improve and grow. And again, my biggest thing is to, to work with the department to create spaces. We do have spaces on the medical school campus, and that's important to know. But what you'll find when you're physically on campus is you'll realize that our building is three blocks away from where the hangout space would be for the medical school. And when you have 50 minutes during lunch and you just want to get some music going and chill, you're like, I, I don't have time to go three blocks away. That, and, it, and again, we live in Chicago and winters in Chicago are not when you want to go running toward the lake and toward the biting wind to connect in that space for 10 minutes. You just, so, I think we're gonna work on that. I'm pushing for it because I'd love to see a little more of that. It's there and it's becoming more formalized than informal. And I'll leave with that thought. Um, I would also very quickly add two things. I, I know that we're over time, but uh, Michelle, um, we were, we're trying to connect, I mean, and well, we, we did, we connected some of the program alumni that are also black with this newly formed um, black student committee. Uh, and this happened very, very recently. And one of the reasons why we wanted to do that was precisely to, um, um, to provide some mentorship and some continuity um, and some, it, to make it easier to just build community in general. But there's definitely a, a lot of support uh, for that. Um, yeah, and there's also, um, there's also the creation of 
a diversity and inclusion special interest group for students. Um, so um, this will be different from an affinity group because um, it's more, uh, it would be more uh, if you're interested in participating in some of these events and, and be a facilitator. So there'll be, there'll be a chance for you to, uh, to join this group, but it's definitely, in the, it's definitely in the works and it will be established by the time you're here. Thank you so much for your input. Awesome. Well, I appreciate all of the questions that you all have had, and I appreciate you, Toby and Roberto, for being here. Um, you know, I just want to end off by saying there's, we have great resources, and I was just uh, looking up to, infer to go off of what you were saying and asking Michelle what the student organizations, I mean, there is, I'm a part of the Black Professional um, Organization for Northwestern, so like it, within a week of starting work here i got recruited they were like okay be a part of like the blacks the black professional organization um i know there's a latino medical student association um there's an asian pacific american medical student association i mean it everybody um has a group you know to go off of what toby was saying a community a group um so just i want you all to take solace and you know be comfortable in knowing that 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 it's here but um, before I let you go, I'm let you know that I'm going to send a follow up email tomorrow to you all that has, excuse me, that includes both Roberto and Toby's email address um, in case you have any other questions for them. Um, I know that I think all of you all are applying this this summer. Am I right? I think all of you guys are. Um, so it's an exciting time. But let us know if you have any questions and um, if nothing else from you all, we are going to say good night and um, we'll be in touch, okay? Awesome. Good night, everyone. Good nice night, to you see all. You Thank you. Good night, Bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Good night, everybody. Thank you.